Hi guys, um, welcome to uh, another uh, special podcast for a special theme. Um, and uh, we decided to do special themes for the end of the year uh, based on, uh, not the lack of questions, but uh, the, um, perhaps the lack of understanding from some of you guys. And uh, we've decided, uh, we, uh, it's the royal we, because uh, I, I, I decided, I, it really wasn't my idea to have the special theme. It was my head of uh, marketing and uh, senior marketing manager and uh, her team um, thought that um, based on all the analysis of all the questions, um, that uh, we should clarify a, a couple of items. So I'm going to take this opportunity uh, at the at year end to, um, you can call it either your uh, holiday gift from me, because it's free, or you can call it a, 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 a New Year gift that you can base your resolutions on. Uh, and although well, I'm not going to talk about goal setting here, I, I set goals between Christmas and New Year's and have for, hell, I guess maybe almost 40 years. Um, but the main subject matter of this, although we're going to divert uh, into a, a few other uh, tangents, is um, do I have what it takes to be a high performance person? And is this really what I want to be a high performance person? Now, I, I can know, do I relate that most of you that are following the personal development and success business, which I don't consider myself a personal development guy, uh, or those of you that follow the, the motivational uh, guys, which I don't consider myself a motivational guy, although I'm told that I'm a very inspirational and motivational uh, type speaker that has great charisma, whatever that means, um, that um, you're doing it because you're filling a void, not because so much you necessarily want to be a high performance person, but you see a lot of your friends, uh, you got out of high school, you, you may have got out of college, five, 10, 15 years have passed, you may have gone to a reunion or two, and you see that some of the other guys and gals are quite successful, or at least a lot more successful than you. I remember when I went to my, my 10 year reunion, uh, in 1973, which is 40 years ago, of course I just had my 50th reunion, uh, it was in Marina del Rey, Los Angeles, and uh, at the, the table, uh, uh, you sit at six, eight, ten people at a table, coincidentally there was a policeman, who a guy I went to school with, and there were two guys that he coincidentally had thrown in jail for burglary, you know, and they each spent two, three, four years. So I told my wife that at the time that I am positive as soon as they have enough to drink, uh, a fight's going to break out. And sure as hell, I was correct. Before midnight, uh, about 11 o'clock, uh, the, the one guy told uh, the cop, uh, blankety blank, and a fight ensued. Uh, and, and, and it wasn't amusing at all. Uh, but of course, then I've been to the 20 year reunion, I've been to the 30 year reunion. Uh, I've been to the, uh, I missed the 35 because of business, I went to the 40 year reunion, I missed the 45 because of business, and I went to the 50 year reunion. And I've seen the, um, the uh, transition of all these guys and gals, and a lot of them uh, are uh, grandparents, and even a few are great grandparents. I'm yet to be a grandparent, although one of my children is, is um, married about a year now. But do I have what it takes? We're going to go through some things that you may or may not have thought of. And the, uh, all this stuff is more or less uh, uh, covered in the book. Uh, it doesn't say, do I have what it takes? And it's certainly covered on, in, the, in the Castle Seminar. And it's certainly covered partially um, on my um, YouTubes that encapsulate parts of, uh, of the uh, Castle Seminar. And when you're trying to decide, do I have what it takes, what you're really asking yourself, is this really what I want? And when, you go through, when we go through some of the sacrifices that I've made and other high-performance people have made, you'll, you know, it's a, uh, in some cases, it'll be a gut-wrenching uh, experience for you to answer, is this really what I want? Uh, you know, like I say, just today, or yesterday, excuse me, we had our, our, our weekly board meeting, and I picked Sundays, uh, this is a Monday, 
Uh, I pick Sundays for my board meetings because it's a, normally a free day. I have less to do because less emails come in, less tweets come in, less requests of my time, and so I don't want that time to go idle. As opposed to you, you want to take Sundays off or Saturdays off or even more off. So we have the board meeting, and at the board meeting, we were sitting around with the uh, board members, uh, long-time board members, and um, we were discussing uh, some future projects, uh, and we were discussing the risk reward in our, our risk portfolio. And even though it was risky, uh, I decided uh, that uh, we would go forward, and uh, my fellow board members agreed with me, and we went forward, made the decision. But during that discussion, I asked one of them, who's a healthy guy, I said, uh, I told him that I was going to have this talk, I was going to be shooting uh, today. Uh, do I have what it takes and is it really what I want? And I said, people tell me all the time how good I look. You know, I'll be 70 my next birthday, but they've been telling me this for at least seven, eight years. Uh, seven, eight years ago, people didn't think I was in my early 60s. They thought I was in maybe my early 50s. Some people that were trying to blow smoke in my ass even thought that, said that I looked uh, even younger than that. Uh, and uh, the older I've gotten, I look about the same. I, haven't, I, I look at pictures of the Castle Seminar, um, the uh, YouTube, and I look about the same, about the last seven, eight years. Some people say I look better the last two or three years than I looked seven, eight years ago. And some people say that I look better the last two, three years for sure than I did uh, 10 or 12 uh, or 14 years ago. Be that as it may. But so I don't look like I'm almost 70. I certainly don't sound like I'm almost 70. I don't know whether I dress like I'm almost 70 because I, I, I've dressed like, like this a long, long time. But I take 160 to 180 pills a day, more or less. Uh, when I travel, maybe I only, uh, when I'm on planes and uh, get, running in on hotels, maybe I only take 60 or 80 pills a day. I take those pills and I, I don't take any drugs. Uh, I'm, uh, as I've told uh, Brian Rose of London Real, I'm high on life. Uh, I don't need to, to, to do the, the drugs uh, that a lot of kids do, uh, DMT, etc. I exercise like a madman. Uh, especially for my age. In fact, uh, two or three times I've shown little short clips in my newsletters of the intensity and the, um, and the passion that I still have for working out. Um, so I eat right. I essentially don't drink hardly any alcohol except for when I travel with my wife. And I hate to say that I, I drink to be sociable, but I, I drink to be sociable because my wife drinks. She doesn't drink a lot, but I drink with her. Um, so if you know that that's what I do to look this way, why do so few, few people do it? Why? There's a pay price to action for everything in life. The, the sacrifices are commensurate with the benefit. Now, when you have a lot of sacrifice built up over time, the benefits become geometric, and that's what the QLA, quantum leap advantage, is all about. But is that really for you? I've said since 1993, it's not everybody's cup of tea. It just isn't. It flat fucking isn't. And after doing it now 21 years, I even realized how, I can't think of the word, how uh, monumental <laughs> my comment was when I said it's not everybody's cup of tea. That was an understatement of fucking biblical proportion. And when we go through it and how we talk about I want you to be in the top one-tenth of a percent. And we'll show you what that means because there's about seven and a half billion people. So that means my market for this is, is only about seven and a half million people. Uh, and it uh, doesn't mean you're going to be the richest seven and a half million people. But uh, those people, when you look at the bell curve, which we will in a moment, uh, are the people that are willing to make that sacrifice. So do I have what it takes? And in most cases, kids, the answer is you do have what it takes, but you're not willing to make the sacrifice because it's not really what you want. Now, we're all born limitless. You know, a three, four, five-year-old kid 
uh, doesn't know from their limits. Uh, you know, and then as we grow older, we get limiting beliefs. I've often said, uh, you know, they ask me, well, what did your parents do differently, Dan, so you have such high self-esteem? And um, I used to say they only did two things differently, but in more reflection, they actually did three things differently. And then one, my mother read a book by Dr. Spock about raising kids. It said never tell them no because it leaves bad. Uh, 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 the result is psychologically bad. N number two, my mother never used to let me crawl around on the ground uh, because uh, we were poor and uh, poorer people had dirtier clothes than less poor. So she carried me on her hip till I was two or three until I could walk. But number three, and I asked this question, what t when did you guys um, realize uh, in your minds there was no Santa Claus or no Tooth Fairy or no you know, Easter Bunny or any of those things? At the last seminar, and I might have mentioned it, but at the last seminar, uh, I asked around and we had people that were seven or eight years old that, that uh, became, uh, uh, became known to them by their parents or by, or by their friends on the streets, etc that there were no uh, of those uh, people uh, like uh, Santa Claus. And we had one young man uh, who said he knew from the very beginning that nobody, uh, there was no Santa Claus and that our parents were our Santa Claus. Well, guess what? I was 11 fucking years old before I realized there was no Santa Claus. 11. My parents never told me. You know, I, t I learned the hard way like we learned a lot of things. Well, but I still believed that there were, you know, uh, I, I was limitless. I still believed that, you know, things appeared out of the, out of, out of the stars or out of the sky or out of the night. Uh, so my limiting beliefs didn't start till I was about 11 years old. And um, the, I still dream. I still think, think that you can act without limits to your abilities. Uh, <clears throat> we're, you know, QLA is about releasing emotional baggage, not gaining emotional baggage. And most of you, and not just you, but most people in the world, <clears throat> gain emotional baggage as they grow older because life beats them down. But I'm here to tell you that what you have learned can be unlearned. And that's what QLA is all about. And you don't have to come to the seminar. We do it best in the seminar, but we've got just countless pages of free content. <clears throat> and virtually everything I've ever done is on Torrent, uh, where you can get it for free. And so you can unlearn it, uh, unlearn uh, uh, bad habits. Um, you know, stay aware of limiting beliefs of others. And, uh, you know, I've told you a lot of times, you know, where the average of the five people that we hung around with most in our first formative years, and unfortunately, in those five people were our mother, our dad, a grandparent, older brother and sister, and none of those people were trained uh, to, be, uh, to teach you how to be a high-performance person. <clears throat> But part of QLA, and part of being a high-performance person, is to get in touch with your emotions. Not, in, uh, not uh, in, in the sense that you would normally think, but in the sense that you know that there's two bank accounts in life. There's a financial bank account and there's an emotional bank account. And though we've been taught and you're more concerned about running out of your money in your financial bank account, it's your emotional bank account uh, that um, is uh, uh, the biggest concern. I was late to go shoot today because one of my uh, young mentees, very successful guy, uh, the, um, he um, is making as much money as many of you that are watching this would be happy if you never made any more fucking money than he does. Uh, he's single, uh, the, and he is now having concerns, emotional concerns, that he's lonely. And uh, he doesn't have a girlfriend, a wife, or any of that kind of stuff, ex-wives or anything like that. And he's lonely. And one of the things that we do at the close of the Castle Seminar is we, we talk about it's lonely at the top. And that high-performance people are like eagles. They fly alone. But it's now catching up to him. He's a very young guy um, and uh, just barely out of high school. And he's already doing very well. And I've talked to him, uh, talked about him, I should say. In, in previous um, uh, podcasts. Um, now, all, not all these things, but all these things can be made better when you get mentors. Um, I just recently uh, saw an article uh, written by uh, Sir Richard Branson that he said, all life gets better for entrepreneurs with mentors. 
and I'll talk about that uh, in, in the near future. But most of you are what I call assholes. A person who constantly asks for your advice, not just mine, but a lot of other people. In fact, when you ask other people for advice, you're making a mistake, because unless they're a high-performance person, you're wasting your time. Uh, yet always does the opposite of what you tell them. Um, I, don't, I don't know why you ask. I do know why you ask, because you're insecure. And you lack self-esteem, self-confidence, self-assuredness. But the bottom line is, you know, you read books, you attend seminars, you buy the, the, the CDs, uh, etc., rather than take action. You're looking to fill that void by listening to somebody else's opinion. And in most cases, whilst most, a lot of these guys and gals are short-term motivators, where they can keep you motivated for a short period of time, there's no intermediate to long-term benefit, and they certainly don't tell you uh, or show you step-by-step, uh, -step, as QLA does, how to build a business. Okay. So, so far, you know, uh, is it, does it sound like this is for you, or do you have what it takes? You should ask yourself after every slide and after every little vignette or analogy I go through, I mean, is this really what I want? Um, kids are not programmed for success. If you've got a good parent, kids are programmed to be loved, okay? <clears throat> but your parents and my parents, with some caveats, you know, gave me a lot of love and your parents hopefully gave you a lot of love. But it's a 50-50 coin. I have kids that come to the seminar that were raped by everybody in their family, extended family, beaten, thrown under bridges, uh, mutilated, set on fire, gone to prison, ex-heroin addicts, ex-foreign legion guys. Um, and, uh, the, and it didn't matter whether their parents were good to them or bad to them. It's a flip of the coin because, as I've said in, in countless times, it's not what happens to us in life, it's how we react, how we assimilate to what happens to us in life. And because of our parents' innate insecurities, which are manifested in how we act, because that's how we were raised, we react poorly. Almost all of us react poorly to stress. I personally love when the shit hits the fan, because that's when I'm at my best. Because the people around me are having trouble, they're fumbling around trying to think of what to do. Now, after 40 plus years of doing this, I know what to do almost instantaneously. Uh, but you're fumbling around because you weren't programmed. And if you're not programmed, you know, I want to say I can understand, but I can't. The only reason I can understand a little is because I've trained thousands and thousands and thousands, either directly or indirectly, through the QLA program since May of 1993. But you're not programmed to be successful. Now, if you have both parents were Olympians, you're more or less, you got great DNA because they got it, they got made it to the Olympics. But unless they go out of their way to teach you how to be a high performance person and how to not accept no for an answer or a result, it's not likely you're going to go to the goddamn Olympics. Forget winning medals, because I take my hat off to those people that went to the Olympics. And I use, I've got a big picture of Eric Hyden who won, I think, seven gold medals in the 1980 Olympics. Uh, and he's got like 33 or 35 inch thighs. I got a picture of him there. And I said, does that, you know, th does that look like he had uh, much balance in his life? And we're going to talk about balance. But he, he was programmed by somebody to be uh, a world-class athlete. And that's why when you have world-class athletes that were former uh, NBA stars and they uh, won you know, two or three uh, uh, championships, those guys have a better opportunity to, um, to coach and get success. I just spent a couple minutes talking about how we're not programmed for success. And as Freud, and I use a, you know, I, I've said that I'm, you know, uh, part Jack Welch, uh, part uh, General Patton, and uh, part uh, Sigmund Freud. Uh, Freud said it uh, probably as well as anybody I've ever read. Uh, and I don't read a lot of books, as I've told you. 
What a distressing contrast there is between the radiant, intelligent child and the feeble mentality of the average adult. Now read it again. What a distressing contrast there is between the, the radiant, intelligent child and the feeble mentality of the average adult. You go to Disney World, you go to those kind of theme parks, you see it in the kids' faces. You go to a birthday party for three, four, five, six, seven-year-olds, you see it in their faces. You see how, you know, radiant they are. Those are the kids that believe in Santa Claus. Those are the kids that believe in Tinkerbell, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Disney fame. Uh, Walt Disney, arguably, had that, that feeling till the day he died. I don't have it in, in the sense that he had it, uh, I, but I do have it because I still think, you know, the Wall of China can still be built. I still think pyramids can still be built. But in the engineering schools we have today, they tell you it can't be built. Well, then how the fuck did they get there? Now, whether they got there from aliens coming down and showing them how to be built or not, I don't know. But we're, we're fairly confident that uh, those stones were cut by human hands. Uh, the, um, but the seminar, uh, the Guthrie Castle seminar, uh, talks about this at great length and how we get fucked up. And I've said it many times, not everybody likes it, not, in fact, almost nobody likes it, that uh, parents fuck you up. They don't do it intentionally, God love them. Uh, now, some of them, if you got Charlie Manson hatchet murder for a parent, they still probably love you, but they fuck you up. And some of the, some of the parents fuck you up on purpose. Um, I, I was fortunate. As I've said, my self-esteem uh, came from my mom, uh, who I was joined at the hip, and I was really a little mama's boy, uh, first seven, eight, nine years of my life. And my dad is work ethic and integrity. Uh, the... Um, you know, I've said a, a jillion times, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. <clears throat> Most of the people that are watching this, for my year-end present to you, or holiday present, or New Year pre or present, whatever you want to call it, um, have um, low performers as your friends. And you pick low performers, guys and gals, because that's where your comfort zone is. And uh, as uh, Jim Newman, my uh, mentor uh, and good friend for 25 years, <clears throat> a famous author of uh, Release Your Breaks, and just to make a comment, uh, what, what does that really mean, Release Your Breaks? Um, it's simple. Well, it's simple now, but it wasn't simple when he wrote the book, you know, 50 years ago or whenever he wrote it. For those of you that are old enough to remember the driving cars that had emergency brake, we had to release the emergency brake. Now the new cars, all you do is you put it in the drive and the emergency brake pops off or releases by itself. Well, for those of us that remember driving the car with our emergency brakes on, the brakes on, it was sluggish. It was bad for the tires, the differential, the U-joints, the, uh, the transmission, the engine. It was, it was bad for everything. And then when you release the brake, the car just surged ahead like in uh, Star Trek, whew, going into uh, uh, warp speed. Well, most of us, most of you guys, have gone through your life with your brakes on. Uh, and your buddies, your, uh, you know, the, the people that you spend the most time with, uh, certainly have the same uh, unfortunate uh, habit of going through life with your brakes on and not stepping outside the box and outside uh, of your comfort zone. Jim Newman, God rest his soul, um, invented, if you will, uh, or initiated the phrase comfort zone. And, uh, and he, he released it and he came out of IBM uh, uh, with uh, Ross Perot about the same time, the brain drain, first brain drain in the early 60s of uh, IBM. And, his, and as I've mentioned, and you can read, I mean, his stable of uh, mentees uh, is pretty phenomenal. Uh, I'm one of which, uh, but he, um, I don't know if I'm the most successful mentee he ever had, but I'm certainly uh, one of the most successful mentees he ever had. But 
he spent a great deal of time in his seminar uh, and uh, teaching me and coaching me and mentoring me, showing me that the reason that I was unhappy, and I talk about that time in 1976, I was sitting, uh, and people ask me, have you ever been depressed? And I say, no. My wife would say, well, what about the time that you were crying, standing uh, or sitting on the, the spiral staircase of our house with our two great Danes, Chewbacca, after Star Wars, and Penelope, licking the tears off my cheeks when I'm drinking about, uh, out of Jack Daniels. I was into Jack Daniels quite heavily in those days. And uh, I realized that I was almost 31 years old, uh, and I hadn't reached 10% of the goals that I had set for my 40th birthday. Nowhere near. So I said, what the fuck am I going to do? You know, I got to do something. I had never been to a seminar, but I had, we had matching Mercedes in the driveway, and we were in a Frank Lloyd Wright type house, four-story house, spiral staircase, etc. And I said, what am I going to do? So I went to my first seminar. Uh, I looked around, uh, not on the internet like a lazy fuck like you, but I looked around and I uh, went to the Psychology of Winning with Dennis Waitley, who had a similar background than I did. He, uh, I believe he went to West Point, uh, but he was an army officer uh, and he was a, a pilot uh, during um, the uh, Vietnam uh, conflict. Uh, and I went to see him and I was pretty impressed with what he said. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, <clears throat> hey, you know, this is great stuff. Who taught you all this stuff? He said, well, my mentor is a guy named Jim Newman and you ought to go see him. Well, unlike you, I took fucking action immediately. And I found out where the fuck his next seminar was. And it was at Pala Mesa, California. Uh, in uh, April of 76, as my memory serves me. And I went to a seminar. And, the, and my world changed. Because I realized that even though, though I had had a lot of success, that I was not being measured against all human beings. I was measuring myself because of my background against other Hispanics. And it was hard, it was, you were hard pressed to find an other Hispanic that had a beautiful blonde wife. I'm not saying that, but I mean a beautiful blonde wife and two matching Mercedes in the fucking driveway. Uh, and uh, he, I immediately changed how I went from a, macro, a micro thinker to a macro thinker. I started uh, challenging myself uh, and raising the bar the, and my benchmarks to include everybody in the world, not just uh, uh, Latinos. Uh, and uh, the world changed for me. And uh, the, um, but Release Your Breaks by Jim Newman is, is, is one of the books that I recommend, and I don't recommend too many. Because, you know, surround yourself with those uh, on the same mission as you. Now, does that look like your friends if you're the lead lion there? The, male, the males aren't the hunters, actually. The females are, and having been on a, a number of safaris and having actually tracked uh, prides uh, uh, this year in uh, Tanzania and uh, in uh, Botswana. The, uh, but does that look like your group? No, it doesn't look like your group. I mean, in no way, shape, manner, or form. You know, maybe if we had a bunch of bunny rabbits <laughs> running there, uh, or um, it's unbelievable, but again, you are who you hang around with, you know? And as Oprah Winfrey says, and which I, I talk about a lot, is that you want people with a like mind and it, that are better than you, smarter than you, more intelligent than you, to get on your bus. And don't be so con concerned about what you're going to do with those people, but you want to, you know, the joint brain is, you know, there's nothing the joint brain collective brain or brains can't overcome and I give the example of the uh, atomic bomb the Manhattan Project and they were put together uh, and they were told we need uh, we need to develop a weapon of mass destruction which they didn't call it that back in those days uh, in the middle 40s to end the war in the Pacific uh, and they did they didn't know if it was implode or explode but they did but if your if, if your team doesn't look like that then you should, I won't say you should give serious thought, you should just fucking change. And we're talking about, you know, is this for you and do I have what it takes? And, and uh, it's one of my favorite comments by Jack Welch, former great CEO of General Electric, arguably the best CEO in the last 50 years, maybe the last 75 years. Um, when he was asked about work-life balance, he said, there's no such thing as work-life balance. There are work-life choices, and you make them, and they have consequences. 
Uh, read it again. There is no such thing as work-life balance. There are work-life choices and you make them and they have fucking consequences. I added the fucking. Now, I'm asked that quite a bit. Uh, and, uh, and before I, I found this quote by Jack Welsh, uh, I used to say, just flat-ass no, there, there is no uh, work-life balance. Uh, Eric Hyden in his 33 or 34 inch thighs. Uh, uh, Ted Turner saying, you can get so much done, more done in a 24 hour day. Uh, Gates, uh, Jobs, Turner again, myself, to name just a few, uh, slept in their office. Uh, and uh, the, when I um, expanded and got the big new offices, 44,000 square feet of offices for Great Western Resources, I, I built a big bathroom with a, uh, a steam bath in it and uh, it, it was quite nice and a big living room area where I could sleep on the couch and it was like a, a little apartment. It wasn't so little actually uh, as, as an apartment. But there are, you know, if, if, if you can't, if you think that you're going to have work-life uh, balance, then, uh, you know, do you have what it takes? I know you have what it takes, but are you willing to make the sacrifices, the pay price, the action? The answer is probably no. So that means, is this really for me? And the answer is probably no, kids. And was Jack Welsh the only one that said this? Was the Dan Penyon QLA since 1993 the only one that said this? The answer is no. Back in the day, back in the uh, 20s, uh, when, um, or the teens, actually, teens, when Napoleon Hill first met Andrew Carnegie, uh, and he was given the task of um, writing the book, and interviewing uh, 500 uh, richest people that uh, Carnegie knew of to write the infinite, in, uh, definitive, I should say, step-by-step -step, uh, uh, road to success and wh how you become successful, he went on and interviewed um, uh, a lot of people. And of the 500 people that he interviewed, uh, to have almost total peace of mind, and I equate total peace of mind with work-life balance. That's 100 years ago. Uh, we call it work-life balance now. There was only three people that had almost peace of mind, which means 497 out of 500 didn't. Now that's 99 something percent, and the three were Burroughs, Edison, and Carnegie until he became obsessed with giving all his money away. Now what does that tell you? 100 plus years ago, the 500 richest people on the planet didn't have any work-life balance. And when you think about Edison, his 10,000 experiments, uh, and I'm not as familiar with the background of Mr. Burroughs, but I know plenty of stories about Henry Ford, uh, et cetera, that there wasn't any. And yet, you ask me quite often uh, on my Facebook, you ask me in, on Twitter, you ask me on uh, LinkedIn, uh, not so much on LinkedIn, uh, about work-life balance, and I, and I keep telling you, but it's like the ass colds from the second slide or so. You go and do exactly the opposite, because that's not what you want to hear. It's not within your comfort zone. And uh, especially this century, the last 14, 12, 14 years, I mean, um, many of you kids have grown up with the idea that you're entitled. Uh, that uh, somebody fucked up the world in the, in the uh, 80s and 90s, and uh, you should be the beneficiaries of better things. Well, you're not. And it's been like this a long, long time. So again, uh, is this really for you? If you're expecting you know, some sort, sort of uh, work-life balance, then it's not for you. It's not. And uh, a few times over the years, uh, more in the 90s than recently, uh, kids have come up to me and say, Dan, I'm glad I went to this seminar because I now realize it's not for me. Well, then you've saved yourself a lot of time, and, and a lot of time and money. And the money you can replace, but the, the time you can't. Because this is you, down at the bottom, and your dreams, and your goals at the other end of the road, and uh, the, road to, uh, the road to success is always under construction, and there's always uh, potholes and speed bumps. But these are the people that, these are some of the things that keep you from achieving your goals. Relatives, first of all, foremost. Because how they raised you. And remember, they didn't do it on purpose, but they, they weren't trained 
to train high-performance people. Friends. Well, you know, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Pessimists, uh, which quite often are your friends. Uh, because it's a lot easier to say it can't be done, and especially by people that haven't done it. And that's why the mentor system and the dream team system is so important, because you then find people that have done it, that know it's possible, that know you can succeed against the odds. Uh, and then there's, of course, your own guilt. Like, my favorite is Jewish guilt. Although I'm not Jewish, but now they tell me they've done our tree that... We might be, ha ha be uh, 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 Jews based on uh, one of my ancestors uh, who was a Sephardic Jew from Spain who moved to uh, Turkey uh, and had a kid by a Mustafa. But anyway, whether that's true or not, I, I like the Jewish guilt uh, the best. Although there's Romanian guilt, there's Italian guilt, you name it, and they've, they've got it. But uh, because I, I have a lot of very close friends that um, uh, are Jews, I, I see how Jewish guilt works. Um, but uh, we're guilty because we're un insecure. We're guilty, and some parents, in which I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you, uh, play on that guilt and, uh, and require stuff from uh, their parents. I, I, I'm, I've been in Asia the last 10 years. And, and Asian parents, for the most part, look at their children as their annuity. They look at, at their children as their retirement. They look at their children as a conduit of themselves. So they weren't fucking successful in life, so let's, let's make sure our kids are successful so they can support us. Well, I liken that to caveman days. In fact, before the shooting, I asked my staff, who are all uh, Asian, here, uh, this reminds me, uh, you know, when I was old, uh, I mean, in old times, thousands of years ago, if the adult, their teeth all fell out, the children and grandchildren would eat the food for the, the old person so he, because he couldn't eat it anymore because he didn't have any teeth. I asked the kids here, would you chew the food of your parent or grandparent, I don't think I said grandparent, but of your parent so they could stay alive um, and they said no. Now maybe they, they probably got guilt now because they said no. But the first words out of their, their mouth was no. Okay. Well, I find it easier to be successful and go out and, and, and make money. And, you know, as I told, said in London Real early on uh, this year, you know, um, you're, when your parent has dementia, when your kid needs uh, new teeth or braces or you need glasses or you need to put your, your, your mom in a rest home or et cetera, et cetera, that costs money. That, all that stuff costs money. You can't buy that shit with Zen, okay? And, um, but yet, yet we're, we're still guilty. Uh, and, and the guilt is a lack of self-esteem, a uh, lack of self-worth and how you were raised. And of course, there's society, society. I mean, society in general tells you you can't be, can't be done. And I, and I say categorically, conventional wisdom is all, almost always wrong. It's almost always fucking wrong. But, but we listen to society. And there's a lot of uh, naysayers that write books about, you know, how, how you can't do this. Uh, Zuckerberg shouldn't have been able to do what he did, but he did. And last but not least, it's just your own innate fear. You couple all those things, uh, guilt, relatives, society, pessimists, and friends, and uh, you have an inordinate amount of fear about uh, reaching your goals. Because you know, once you reach the goal, let's say, it's harder to continue to reach goals. What are people going to expect of me now? Right now I haven't done anything, so nobody's going to expect anything from me. So if fear, guilt, relatives, society, pessimists, and friends all work against your dreams in fulfilling your goals. Okay, so you've seen how the gauntlet that you've got to go through from your dreams to your goals and all the things that are working against you. And, and basically what, why you have so much trouble fighting off those, 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 those obstacles is because weak desires bring weak results. Just a small amount of fire makes a small amount of heat. Napoleon Hill said that. 
is because of your innate weaknesses, which are, have been, are a manifestation of how you've been raised. But notwithstanding how you've been raised, if you really, really, really want something in life, and you can think about certain things. Some of you really wanted to go out with this person. Somebody you really wanted to marry this person. Somebody, you know, I, I, I give the example, uh, some couples have trouble conceiving, having kids. Uh, and they don't just give up, do they? They go to uh, fertiliz in fertilization doctors. They go, and not just one, sometimes they go to 15, 20, 30 of them. Uh, they, they, they really, really go out of their way <coughs> to, to try anything humanly possible. Uh, and uh, because it's something they really want. Well, what if you approach life like that? Now, in some cases, they still can't conceive kids, so then they adopt and they become loving parents. And my experience is often adopted parents are more loving than natural parents. But that's a whole other story. Um, but they really want that, so they really do everything humanly possible. They don't give up the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, eighth, fifteenth, twentieth time. They keep trying and trying and trying. Well, just imagine if you did that vis-a-vis -vis your dreams. Now, women say there's nothing stronger than the dream of, 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 of procreation. I don't know that. But I do know for the most fact that women are normally my best mentees because they're tougher than men. Their emotional uh, baggage, although there's a lot of it, they're used to dealing with it, and I think that's because of uh, the ordeal of motherhood, whether they're a mother yet or not. But when you think about not doing something, or you think about, well, I don't want to work today, or I don't want to work late tonight, uh, equated to you know, this analogy I've given you about um, couples tr trying to conceive, they don't give up. Uh, and the, uh, we give up too easily. We just give up too easily. Because, you know, I want you to, and the people that have been successful, and the people that this is probably is for, you know, is, you know, do I have what it takes? Almost all of you do. Um, is, is this really what I want? I want you to make the big, bold decision. Because if you don't make the big, bold decision, and you play it safe, and you stay where you are, is that what you want? You wouldn't be listening to these podcasts if you wanted to stay where you are. You wouldn't be going to my site. We have about 40% of the people that come to danpena.com are um, repeat devotees. And we have about 10 or 15% of the people that come to my site who come, you know, a couple dozen times uh, a month. And we have some that come over 100 times a month. Uh, because reading everything on the site doesn't get you there. You have to assimilate it. It has to be part of your normal uh, uh, regimen. You have, to, you have to be indoctrinated with it. And so you, ha and you do that by reading it over and over and over. Um, I, had a, uh, I have a friend, God rest his soul, uh, Charlie Conrad, uh, who was the third man to step on the moon, an astronaut. And he, he used to say that um, they repeat things Everything that possible, every permutation, every possibility, and they repeat it countless times until it becomes rote memory. QLA has been in my life for a long time. I was living the QLA model even before I called the QLA, you know, uh, 40 years ago, ever since I uh, graduated from Office of Candidate School in July 1967. I didn't call it that same time. But basically, uh, uh, losing or not accomplishing the mission was an option. was not an option. That's what they taught you. Um, and uh, the last 21 years, I've, I, I've, I've seen it and I've, uh, I, I've lived it. Uh, and so it's second nature to me. I mean, I answer questions, although I have these slides. You know, I could uh, make a similar talk without slides, um, but uh, without cue cards. But it's part of my life. The most successful mentees that I've had over the last 21 years are the people that uh, make it part of their life, where uh, no is never an option and completion of the mission is not an option. They just get it done. They just go fucking do it no matter what it takes. As long as it's legal, moral, ethical, you're not breaking any laws. Um, but you want to stay where you are. If it doesn't bother you, if it doesn't make you ill, if it doesn't make you nauseous, if it doesn't make you uncomfortable staying where you are in your current comfort zone, then this is 
absolutely fucking not for you. Don't waste your time. Fucking unsubscribe. Do us both a favor. You know, I say sarcastically, you're taking up my bandwidth. I don't know if technically that's really true, but you know, go do something else. And I would also recommend um, that you don't need to waste your time on a bunch of personal development success materials. All you're doing is filling the void where you should be taking action. You're obviously then happy being where you are. We are brought into uh, this life um, innocent. Then life happens. Most info given a reference success is wrong, unless you are lucky, which is questionable, uh, enough to have a high performance wealth creators as parents. This is an interesting topic. I say, which is questionable. Napoleon Hill said, and I agree, uh, the most fortunate man or woman, he didn't say woman, but most fortunate person is the, that person that is born into poverty. Now, there are certainly people that were born into greater poverty than I. Uh, and uh, as I admitted uh, to my wife here recently, she was poorer than I was growing up. And uh, she, she felt that like uh, a big success to get me to admit that. Um, because when we talk about uh, vacations, uh, my parents, uh, you've seen on my site where my house used to be, Sally lived in a little caravan. Caravan is like a small mobile home, that four people in about, uh, I want to say, 30, 20 or 30 square meters. And uh, she remembers that very vividly. Uh, and uh, she remembers going to Blackpool. Or her, parent, her family was from Blackpool. And I've gone to Blackpool with her a couple times. And it's not one of the great uh, <laughs> vacation places on the planet, believe me. Uh, and the, uh, and I, when we're watching these movies and... Uh, Sally, had you ever been to Disneyland? Of course, they, they didn't have Disneyland. They had Disneyland, but she, she was in, uh, in England, so she had never been to Disneyland. And Disney World or Paris had been opened up afterwards. Have you ever been to any theme parks? She says, yeah, the, uh, the one in Blackpool. Well, that's not exactly a theme park. And so I remember going to Disneyland in 1955, shortly after it opened. And my dad and my mom took me. My dad was a cop, policeman. He pivoted into other careers, but at that time he was a policeman. He wasn't making very much money. Uh, and I remember him even taking us to Las Vegas once. And we stayed and we were watching a movie um, about Bugsy Siegel, the, who was really the founder of Las Vegas. Uh, and he had the Flamingo Hotel. Well, I remember what the Flamingo Hotel looked like in the 50s. And uh, we stayed at the Hacienda Hotel, which is a little uh, kind of like a uh, Hotel 6, Hotel uh, Motel 6 hotel in Vegas, where the rooms at that time, if I remember correctly, were like 12 bucks a, a night, and my mother, my dad, and I used to stay in one room. So I went to a couple places. So we had enough money to do that kind of thing once in a while, but uh, the, uh, and, and Sally never had any of that, you know. She used to go out with her grandmother, I used to beat her with a spoon, a wooden spoon, if she was uh, out of line, and uh, they used to go, and uh, they, uh, went to, to visit with a cousin at Blackpool and they had, I think they, she told me, they had one or two pounds a day that they could spend um, on uh, luxuries. And a luxury was normally a fish, a fish and chip dinner and they'd split it, her and her little, little grandmother, uh, and they'd get an ice cream. And they did that. That was their only meal for the day. Well, we had more food than that. And uh, so... Um, be, having uh, poor parents, Sally and I both easily uh, qualify. Uh, so, but unless you had rich parents that understood what it was to uh, train their children, their, uh, their uh, progenies, to be high-performance people, you, might, you, you would have much rather have been uh, better off uh, having poor parents. Now... QLA is easier if you've got some money to start with. But QLA was based on 
having no money, or as they say in Britain, nay money. Because I had no, the reason, people ask me, well, why, why did you develop this system, Dan, uh, that you started with nothing? And I said, it's very simple, because I had fucking nothing, okay? Even though I had made some money before, I had spent it all, lost it all, whatever. Uh, and uh, so I had no money. I had 820 bucks. Um, but we're brought into life innocent, and then life happens to us. Again, do I have what it takes? Most of you out there do. Is this really for me? The answer, as we go through these, this presentation, more and more of you are either saying, hey, this is what I, I mean, this is what I want, or, well, I'm not, I'm not so sure I, I'm willing to make those sacrifices. And if there's even a shadow of a doubt that you're maybe not willing to make those sacrifices, this, this, this shit's not for you. Self-confidence, is it nature or nurture? I'm often asked, and again, we're getting back to, uh, do I have what it takes? Again, almost all of you, the answer is yes. Is this really what I want? And I, and I believe that for most of you, it's not. But is self-confidence something that you're born with or is taught and developed? It's, a cla it, it, it's the classic nurture versus nature argument. Now, I certainly wasn't born this way. Um, I have good genes. I look young. Uh, but part of me looking younger than I really am is the fact that I work so fucking hard at it. Okay? And I, and I realize, because uh, I have pride in what I look like. Okay? And there's, a, you know, uh, and there's a big difference in my mind between pride and ego. A lot of people say that ego drives me and drives other high-performance people. Well, I can't speak for other high-performance people, but I sure as shit can speak for myself. Pride drives me. I want to be the very best at what I do, no matter what. Uh, and that has even gotten stronger and stronger and stronger since I started coaching. Uh, but it can, your, your high performance attributes can be nurtured. But starting with what my parents did for me when I was uh, young, no-nos, work ethic. Uh, I, it's a little hard for me to say without a smile on my face, you know, Make sure your kids believe in Santa Claus as long as they can. Uh, and uh, that's part of the nurture. You know, education wasn't in high priority uh, when I was growing up because I was always getting in trouble. Uh, but um, the, uh, so I, I believe you can't, it doesn't hurt to have good genes, uh, which I obviously got from my parents who lived to be uh, uh, around this planet a long time. But, but to nurture it. Speaking of nurture, we had a, 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 a woman and her husband wanted to bring their 10-year-old, uh, I might have mentioned this before, to the seminar, but I decided that the 10-year-old little girl was too young to come to the seminar uh, because some of the things we discussed, uh, sh hell, she may believe in Santa Claus still, uh, are, uh, which is good, but to hear her, for her to hear some of the things, not only what I say, but what the attendees say, and I don't want the attendees that would have attended with her uh, to be stifled in their thought process because it's not fair to them because they're not being able to use the seminar for what it's worth. But you can nurture them, and I appreciate the idea that the woman wanted to bring her 10-year-old. It's a little too young, but I'm hoping that, you know, in another three or four years, uh, five years, uh, when she's 15, that she'll be able to do it. But, but you can nurture. You can. Because, you know, we think, you know, what do we see when we look in the mirror? Do we see a little pussycat? Most of you are pussycats. Um, when I look at myself in the mirror, this is what I see. I see, you know, uh, Leo the lion. And I tell the story, which is true, it's not, a, it's not fiction, uh, that I have a different outlook on uh, things that would normally make you afraid. But we've all got the lion in us. You know, I, I, I give a section in the, at the castle, it's called Release the Beast. As some people say, it's easier for me to be a beast, which the people that are saying that, I believe in my heart. And I do have a heart, and I do have uh, blood running through my veins, that they're trying to say it as not such a uh, complimentary thing. But I 
turn it around and I say, it is complimentary. And uh, not all of us like what we look like. That's a whole other subject, and we, we, we talk about that in the seminar at great length. Um, you know, I'm, too t I'm not tall enough. Uh, I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. My breasts aren't big enough. My, you know, my breasts are too large. My ass is too big. My, ah, I can go on and on and on and on. And uh, the, um, but those that feel confident in themselves see this. Now, this was me. I'm 13 years old. This is 1959, uh, March of 59. You see the date on the picture. It's also in my book, I believe, both uh, my last uh, uh, first and second edition of your first 100 million. That's me under, remember the lion running with a crowd of lions, and remember the lion that the, the pussycat saw in the lion picture as a reflection. That's Jackie the lion, uh, Jackie, I think the sixth or seventh. That's the Metro Golden Mayor lion as about a two-year-old male uh, crawling on my back, as you can see. My mother was holding the camera in horror. My dad was off to the left. And Melvin Kuntz, the guy that owns Jackie the Lion, he had a place called World Jungle Compound. And during the Depression, my dad, who lived in East LA, Boyle Heights, the Mexican Beverly Hills, BH, uh, they, uh, he got a, a lion pup uh, somehow, and he raised it, and finally the neighbors told him that he had to get rid of the, the lion because the lion was killing cats and stuff. And so he went to the movie theaters, and he went to Metro Golden Mayor, uh, and uh, sold it or gave it to uh, Metro Golden Mayor, and that's how the lion, when you hear the, ah, the big lion in Metro Golden Mayor, that was his great-grandfather back in the 30s. And, uh, the, um, and, and Melvin Coons had this place called, that's in Thousand Oaks, California, about 30, 40 miles outside Los Angeles. And um, as you can see, uh, I didn't look afraid. Um, I didn't uh, look uh, that uh, I thought something was going to happen. Of course, lions that big can kill you. Lions that big can eat your head off. Or lions that big can do you a lot of goddamn da damage. Uh, as uh, Sigrid and Freud uh, in Las Vegas showed about 10, 12 years ago when the, the big cat ate away part of his head. He lived, fortunately. Uh, and, um, but that's how, that's how I was raised. Now, most of you parents wouldn't allow your kid to do that. And now because of the politically correct bullshit that we go through, most, for sure, none of the zoos, etc., allow you to do this. Uh, and I was just fortunate through serendipity that uh, Melvin Kuntz, the nice man, when my father took me there, uh, and we used to do a lot of things, go places that didn't cost any money, and we got to go to World Jungle Compound for no money. But when, we, when Sally and I were uh, in Thailand last year, um, I, I, I jumped and fought with a, the big tigers. Uh, and I believe those pictures are on uh, YouTube. Uh, and, uh, and to this day, I'm, uh, I'm not afraid. And my parents, in, in, inadvertently, by accident, were training me to be a high-performance person. Now, I certainly had no aspirations of ever being in the circus. I, I certainly had no aspirations of ever training lions. But look at that. I mean, and here we are. That was 1959. So I was almost, uh, I was 13 and a half, and now I, I, I'm 69. So, uh, 56 years ago, that was a training that I was going through. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that you do the same with, um, with your kids, um, but it's one of the reasons I'm not afraid of animals. It's one of the reasons I'm not afraid of big animals. And big animals are afraid of me. Big 200-pound Great Danes are afraid of me. Big Mastiffs are afraid of me um, because they, they operate under the, the pack system and uh, they realize that I'm a, an alpha male. So there I was with a lion, okay? Now the fact that the lion didn't eat, <laughs> eat me or tear my arm off or whatever, uh, and what that picture doesn't show is that after that picture was taken, the lion pushed me over on my side and I'm rolling around on the ground with it and my mother 
stopped taking pictures and panicked, but I was fine. I was fine. I, I wasn't scared or fearful for, for a moment. And part of the reason I believe I wasn't, as Albert Einstein said and has depicted in this uh, slide, uh, the uh, imagination will get you everywhere. And I was fantasizing about being Tarzan. I was fantasizing about being some, you know, uh, some uh, foreign uh, explorer in a, in a distant land. But logic will get you from A to Z, and imagination will get you everywhere. Now, little did I know that uh, later on uh, I would meet the great grandson of um, uh, the guy that invented Tarzan. Uh, uh, and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs is great grandson, or excuse me, great, uh, yeah, uh, great grandson, uh, Danny Burroughs. Uh, little did I know that I'd, you know, um, hunt wild animals, um, uh, which I stopped doing many years ago. Little did I know uh, that I'd be run over by a goddamn buffalo. Uh, little did I know that I do some of the, the crazy things with animals that I've done. But I'm sure that that fact that I had been exposed to that line at 13 years old, uh, you know, uh, added to my imagination of what was possible. Um, and I didn't develop, as almost all of you uh, in, that are reading, or excuse me, listening to this, the, um, the syndrome that you wanted to f fit in. Most of the kids that I, I dealt with, uh, and although I did suffer from it a little, and I say the word suffer, um, that, uh, but they wanted to fit in. Now, the only thing I wanted to fit in is I didn't want to get in a lot more trouble than I was already getting in. You know, for a kid that was um, expelled three times from school, uh, expelled, thrown out of school three times before he was 10 years old, uh, is pretty significant, and, and that's why... My parents moved uh, uh, shortly thereafter to a new neighborhood so I could uh, get a fresh start, as it were, at the time. But I wasn't too, uh, uh, too worried about fitting in. And, you know, is this really for you? Most of you have been raised, if not uh, almost all of you have been raised, with the idea to fit in. Don't, you know, now, one thing, don't get in trouble. I understand that. But a lot of you have done drugs to fit in with your fr uh, friends. And uh, a lot of people tell me that uh, you don't understand what peer pressure is. Well, peer pressure in the barrio, in my judgment, is, is a lot tougher than peer pressure uh, living in uh, the suburbs to do drugs. Um, but um, today, peer pressure is, is pretty fierce. But if you're desperate to fit in, then QLA is not for you. And if you're desperate to fit in, then, um, you know, uh, even though you've got what it takes, uh, this isn't for you. But if you're f desperate to fit in the high performance model, then you've got to go no fucking farther down the road than this. You have found it. it there's no guilt edge panacea. There's no absolute guarantees. But I do know this. Every single person that has ever touched um, QLA has either decided it was for him or her and gotten better or decided it's not for them and left it alone and hopefully went on to be happy. Uh, the, um, but this is not for the individual that is desperate to fit in unless it's to fit in the high performance model. Because as Freud again said, intellectualization is the most reliable of defenses. What you all do, what your parents did, what your grandparents did, and what you've taught your children is to rationalize what you've done, where you are, and unfortunately where you probably end up. And that's a defense mechanism. It's a coping, a coping mechanism. Uh, and uh, that's unfortunate. And I believe it's nurtured it, it's not nature. In other words, you're not born with a DNA. You're not born with um, your ability to make excuses, <clears throat> alibis for your defenses. In the seminar at the castle, we spend a probably 45 or 50 minutes going through a number of alibis, excuses that I've received in 21 years of being a coach, mentor, high performance 
with high, high, uh, potentially high performance people and many of them ultimately becoming high performance people. After the first couple slides, and I normally have somebody else read it, after the first couple slides they think it's going to be over and then it goes on and on and on. And so several slides later they uh, realize that the excuses and the bullshit rationalization that you have for not being more successful are almost endless. Almost endless. Because uh, it's, it's, it's the most, you know, rationalizational, intellectualization uh, is the most reliable of defenses, and it has been since uh, Freud's day. Now, this is a great example. We show this slide two or three times in the, in the Castle Seminar. <clears throat> it's from one of my mentees who's on the Hall of Fame from his mother who I know, I happen to know her pretty well. She's a few years younger than I am, and we've gotten to be uh, good friends. They live in the United States, and this is to her son. Hi, honey. Please tell Dan hi. He is on my mind and my heart. He is so right about women, in parentheses, moms, fucking up, in parentheses, their children's lives. Signed, Mom. Now, I've had grandfathers, daughters, granddaughters in the seminar. We've had a few times three generations, uh, and we've had two generations on uh, more than one occasion, and we've had brothers, sisters, twins, etc. And when we get around to this exercise in the seminar about uh, how they got fucked up, and when the granddaughter turns and looks at the mother, and the mother turns and looks at the, uh, the father, the grandfather, um, why we are the way we are. And, and, and this is not the only mother uh, or parent that has written me. And it's not the only castle uh, attendee, and she's never attended the castle. Her, 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 her child has attended the castle on, on several occasions. Um, that the actual people in the seminar say that, you know, they're fucking up their own kids now. Because several, you know, many, many people that come to the seminar have grown children and have even grandchildren. Uh, and hopefully when they go back to their regular lives, they'll never be regular again and they'll never be normal, they'll learn from this expo exposure that, you know, that that's not what they want to do to their kids. But moms admit it. And moms normally admit it more readily than dads. So I'm not making this shit up, guys. You know, and all our parents, my parents included, although they did a lot of real right things, you know, I was, I was fortunate. But I took those right things and I ran with them. Um, and, uh, you know, I've talked to this guy's mom on many occasions about this. And she says, you know, it's, I know, Dan, it's, to, it's all bullshit, but we did the best we could. And, well, but I tell her, but the best wasn't good enough, was it? And she says, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Here's a cute picture, one of my favorites. And the, and the, the seminar attendees go crazy when they see this. It's, it's a picture of a psychiatrist talking to a bird. And it says, my mother used to puke in my mouth. How can you be normal if your mother pukes in your fucking mouth? Well... The, 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 the analogy is well put, but that's, you know, it's no wonder the kids get fucked up. And by the way, I get these slides from parents, mothers, daughters, grandchildren. You know, you'd be fucked up too. What it's really saying is you'd be fucked up too if your mother puked in your mouth to, to live. Uh, now this is a, uh, uh, from one of my weekly reports from a, uh, a mentee that to, uh, will remain anonymous. I have the, my, my weekly reports are divided into three sections. Accomplishments for the week. There's, there's breakdowns, but I'm making it simple now. Goals for the next week and problems and challenges. This, this young uh, person um, filled out the problems and challenges and he's relating a conversation he had with his father. Talked with my dad yesterday. He was very uh, unsupportive of my goals. The conversation was, some, uh, was something like, was something similar to the scene of the movie Rot Rudy, uh, uh, where the father tells the kid it's not 
for people like us. Remember Rudy Rudica's dad's telling him, people like us don't go to Notre Dame. People like us don't play football at Notre Dame. People like us work at the such and such and support our families. Uh, I don't understand this kind of mentality, um, i.e. not to have go high goals, the kids writing uh, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Lately, I've also had a strong wake up realization that most people that um, I'm surrounded with and uh, talk to are small minded. I have to escape from the, the convention, conventional uh, life and put uh, myself in a new uh, setting where I want to be. Well, conventional wisdom is almost always wrong. This father is just relating what the mother in the slide previous to this about fucking up their kids. Here's a father who I happen to I not personally know, but I happen to know he's a well-educated engineer uh, who is telling his son, um, who's also not as well-educated as his dad, but uh, is, a, is a college university graduate, which doesn't make you successful, uh, that uh, to be uh, to have goals like he's got uh, are not realistic and not for him. Now, wh why would any parent tell their kid that? You tell me. Again, do you have what it takes? This kid does. And he's gone on to do successful things since he wrote me this. This is part of the year-long mentor program. Is it for you? For this kid, it's still for you. And he's fighting against his, his dad, his mom's more supportive, but his mom doesn't talk to his dad about it, as it what occurs in many, many families. So he has what it takes, and he's showing he has what it takes, and is it for him? And he's going against the grain. He's going against his parents. Now, you know, there's a lot more that happens subsequent to this, you know, uh, being uh, disowned, more or less, by his dad. Uh, but he wants this kind of success more than anything. So he's making that sacrifice. The question is, are you willing to make that sacrifice? That's the question. Here's a young person that was willing to make the sacrifice, and this was on, uh, online, in the, the Mail Online, that's an uh, English newspaper. They only, shot, they only shot a body, but they cannot shoot my dreams. Pakistani girl shot by a Taliban reveals she wants to be prime minister uh, as she misses out on the Nobel Peace Prize. She almost got the Nobel Peace Prize uh, a year or two ago. Well, this woman, young woman, uh, who's now I think 14 or 15, something like that, obviously, did she have what it takes? Absolutely. fucking uh, Is it for her? Absolutely. fucking -lutely. Now, most people that almost got their brains blown out or got part of their face shot away would, um, you know, many people, I won't say most, would lose resolve, you know. She's obviously made the pay price to action, and now she's under current uh, constant death threat. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if she isn't prime minister. Um, but now, man, sacrifice are, are costly. Do you have what it takes? Yes. Are you willing to pay the price? Only you can answer that question. And here's a kid that answers the question. Uh, and I have to stand up to read this because it's a little far away. Uh, it's a kid floating on a balloon, uh, being lifted up, and he's going like this, so fuck you, and it says, um, everyone just wants to be liked and accepted. The kids on the ground are saying that, uh, except for uh, Tim. Tim doesn't give a shit. Well, I'm, I'm one of the few people that you know that truly, when he says he doesn't give a shit what other people say or think, is uh, telling you the absolute truth. I don't. And I haven't given a shit for a long time, uh, but I've been blessed with uh, high self-esteem for a long time. And uh, the, uh, in many of my mentees, it started out uh, that uh, gave a shit, don't give a shit now, and that manifests itself in different ways in how you deal with your family, how you deal with your, uh, your partners, your spouse, uh, how you deal with your kids, how you deal with your employee. Should you have uh, uh, how you deal with your employer? 
Should you have an employer? Should you be on your own? This manifests itself in a lot of ways. And you don't have to do it this way, fuck you. But if you want to be a high performance person, if you think that Jobs, Gates, Ted Turner, Donald Trump, Zuckerberg, um, care what you think, you're living in a dream world. They don't. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, can you make that transition closer to their and my end of the continuum where you care less? If, if the answer is yes, then this is for you. I'm hoping, I'm praying, I'm wishing uh, that you take action after you hear this podcast. And uh, even more action than just listening to the podcast. And it doesn't mean coming to the Castle Seminar. You know, uh, uh, thankfully, uh, you know, Castle Seminar seemed to be fully booked uh, in, in recent months. But avail yourself of all the opportunities on uh, my website. Uh, avail yourself of the free torrent stuff. Uh, avail yourself of the tests, etc. Of all the YouTube uh, information. There's, there's a plethora of information about QLA and how to be a high performance person. Uh, only you can decide. I've already told you, do you have what it takes? And the answer is yes. But do you, you know, do you want this? Is this what you want for you? Are you willing to pay, you know, it depends on whether you're pay, willing to pay the uh, pay price to action, the sacrifice. Only you can answer that. I can't. <clears throat> Here's a young mentee that wrote me this, this earlier this year, um, who's uh, on the Hall of Fame as well. Uh, <clears throat> this was written to me. I'll start from the bottom up. I don't know why. I guess this is the way they come on Twitter. Uh, December 24th. Uh, gotta hear it, huh? <clears throat> oh, I'd asked him, who taught you all this stuff? Gotta hear it, huh? Get my most important uh, skills uh, while being kick-ass mentored by Dan Pena. Uh, again, on December 24th. Dan Pena, um, this is one for your book. Um, let's see. Uh, the, teach, the teachings of Dan Pena made me $50 million hard cash. <clears throat> January 1, it's... It's good, uh, all, uh, it's, it's Dan Pena fashion, <clears throat> all 2014 goals are defined in writing and between audacious and seemingly unreachable, unre uh, topping it up once again. He does his goals, as I taught him, between, uh, at the end of the year. And then on January 3rd, uh, got to admit, at 12 years later, I'm still using the weekly report system uh, that Dan Pena hit me with uh, reporting to myself uh, for the, over eight years. <clears throat> he's been out on his own for eight years. And he's, uh, now he's made a lot more than $50 million, but that's a $50 million hard cash he put in the bank. He's been involved in you know, hundreds of millions in projects, and, he, and he's built up a nice set net worth. And today, I believe he's, uh, well, he'll be 38 this year. 38, or he's, oh, he's 38, or he just turned 38 this year. And I uh, started with him when he was about 24, 25. Uh, and uh, he has no formal education. Uh, and he was an entrepreneur since he's 16. Comes from a little town, uh, uh, small population. Uh, and my advice to him, he had to leave where he was. And not only did he leave the town, <coughs> the country, he left the continent. <clears throat> and he is now in the uh, Western Hemisphere, being very, very successful, and I'm proud as hell of him. In fact, I saw him about a year ago. One of the places we stopped off on one of our trips, Sally and I, hadn't seen him in a few years, hadn't seen him in five, six years, uh, and he was doing terrific, and I'm, I'm proud as hell. But he's still using the weekly reporting system, but he had to get out of his comfort zone, and I told him he had to get out of his comfort zone if he wanted to do the things he wanted to do. I just gave you an example of a guy, a young man, uh, who had to leave his small town, uh, had to leave his family behind, um, had to, uh, didn't have to do anything, but he wanted to follow the QLA, uh, and uh, not only left the town, the country, the continent, uh, and is very successful. Here's another example. 
coincidentally from the same continent, uh, neighboring countries. Um, but his reaction was incredible. I got all I uh, wanted to have. Okay, I gave him uh, as well something, but all uh, at the end, I will profit more. I hate to tell you this over and over again, but your QLA stuff is like magic. You can play with all these guys, and this one attended an Ivy League uh, school with the summa cum laude, bing bang. I don't know what bing bang means, but I do know that this guy was a, uh, a uh, Ivy League grad, uh, and he's, in fact, he's a TV personality, he's very, he's very famous, and this kid that, that, um, that uh, took advantage of him in a, in a, in a legal, uh, moral way, uh, only has a high school education, uh, no university, uh, but uh, was uh, uh, a, uh, at one time a world-class athlete uh, and uh, the, uh, his athletic career when he blew his knee out. But he says it works like magic and he, and he doesn't want to tell me again, but uh, that's fine, he can tell me, but you know, uh, and this is a kid um, that doesn't read a lot of books uh, and uh, because I've convinced him that taking action is what's important. Uh, the, um, uh, the first kid was a, a graduate of uh, uh, the Castle Seminar, and this kid has been to the Castle Seminar a few times. And um, as compared these two with the previous kid, who his father uh, told him that uh, being a high-performance person wasn't for him, it was unrealistic, and he succeeded in spite of um, uh, what he was told by his parents. The kid, that, the f slide before this, that had accumulated the 50 million in cash, his parents were supportive, but he had to leave his parents because his parents weren't uh, in the business of being training high-performance people. And this young man, who was a world-class athlete, his parents were supportive when he was uh, uh, competing uh, at a world-class level. Um, and, uh, but he uh, is in the process of making his quantum leap beyond the wildest expectation of his parents. So I've given you a couple of examples, one with not supportive, one with uh, uh, medium support, and one with uh, uh, tremendous support. And uh, the, uh, they've all had relatively the same results in that they busted out of their comfort zone and they're going for uh, the gold, uh, pun intended, for the uh, world-class part. <clears throat> now, again, have we, um, do we have it in us? The answer is yes. Do we, uh, are we willing to make the sacrifices? Is this really for me? I I'm going to go through a comparison. If you're 10% or 5% of the things, you know, I, I, I'm allegedly infamous for, which is called the Dan Pena brand, you'll be highly successful. Um, people often tell me, Dan, I can't talk like you. My communication skills are nowhere near as good as yours. Uh, I don't have the charisma you do, etc." Okay. Well, I've developed this over the years, but if you're 5% as good as I am, uh, these are some of the things that you'll be able to accomplish. Um, the, um, I've, cr I've created through my mentees uh, and my devotees uh, since 1993 over 50 billion dollars uh, in uh, equity and value. Um, the story from the barrio to the castle, which is uh, since uh, 1984, I've been in the castle th 30 years now, is uh, famous now. And in fact, as we speak, uh, I'm still in the, uh, discussions. Uh, reference uh, a uh, reality show, and possible uh, release in my book, uh, possible, possibly a documentary, and some other pretty uh, neat things. Um, because of the dedication I had and the sacrifices that I was willing to make, I was able to create um, 50 million dollars in revenue my first year in business. This is pre-internet, uh, when I had uh, one employee, me, a fax machine, uh, lease fax machine, a phone in the spare bedroom of my house. That 50 million is worth, uh, worth uh, equal or equivalent to about 100 million in today's dollars. I turned 820 dollars into 450 million dollars, uh, now about 1 billion dollars in eight years in a collapsing market. Again, this is pre-internet. 
Uh, my favorite, and uh, it's not everybody's favorite, but turning $60,000 into $65 million, uh, now about $100 million pre-internet uh, uh, in uh, 100 days is pretty uh, goddamn amazing uh, and uh, matches up to anybody's standards. Uh, I was first to obtain an option uh, to purchase something, not owning it, public on a major stock exchange, uh, which is one of my favorites. Um, and, maybe, and some of the things that I've just listed here uh, is why they call me the financial wizard or the financial magician. Um, um, I've been a super high performance person in six decades. I've been involved in 700 transactions uh, uh, all over the world, uh, either as an agent, a principal, advisor, etc. Um, I've done $25 billion in individual deals, not part of the $50 billion I created. So I've been part of uh, those 700 deals uh, uh, were part of the uh, $25 billion. Uh, I've got uh, over 20 years extraordinary coaching and mentoring. I've managed mid managers uh, to CEO of Global 25 uh, companies in seven years, namely Klaus Kleinfeld. I have the only week-long uh, castle experience uh, in his castle, in his, which is his own home. Not being braggadocious, but uh, you know, uh, although I just gave my Cobra to my uh, son on his 30th birthday, but I've been driving Cobras, Bentleys, Aston Martins, and chauffeured limousines uh, for over 30 years. I haven't been driving, been driven around, I should say. Uh, I have the only year-long free mentor program. Uh, why do I give it free? Because I'm not making a living off of you guys. I give everything free. I make the seminar costly, although I don't think it's costly because I haven't risen, uh, raised the price in about 15 years. But I want, you to ha I want you to have to pay price to action. I want you to have skin in the game. And that's why I uh, invented uh, or initiated the PPP, Pen Your Payment Plan. I initiated, invented, uh, what, however you want to call it, QLA, which is dream team. Success fees, meaning the lawyers and accountants will come on board for success fees at the um, culmination of your first transaction. Step-by-step, -step, no money startup system, uh, memorialized in the book, your first hundred million. I've mentored people like Mikey the Pizza Boy uh, uh, to uh, be a movie maker in six years. Uh, I've, got, I've had thousands of businesses started and CEOs created. I've mentored CEOs, athletes, Olympians, doctors, lawyers, PhDs, specialists, spiritualists, idiots. I'm, uh, I've mentored them all. And they're all the same and they can all achieve uh, their goals. Um, your first hundred million, the first edition and the second edition is the, the only manual that I know, only template, where it goes takes you from zero to wealth, uh, starting with no money. Um, so again, the things that I've talked about so far on this Dan Pena brand slide, they call me the financial magician, financial wizard. Some of these things, when I write them down on, on a piece of paper or slides, I'm, I'm surprised that I was able to do them, but I know I did them. After 40 years, I still feel responsible uh, if email is not returned promptly. And this is really important. High performance people to get back to you. It pisses me off, although I understand it, when people say, Dan, oh, thanks for getting back to me so soon. What the fuck do you think? You know, I still feel responsible. I still can't ex uh, accept failures as an option after 40 plus years. Uh, I have multiple QLA product awards based on deals, not on theory. My, all my awards for QLA product are based on deals, not theory. I have multiple success coaching awards, including the Rob Report Coach of the Year. Um, I've, I've dealt with many foreign governments, including uh, the Bank of England and the Vatican. I've been involved in over 75,000 business decisions. What the fuck? Um, and I never, ever forget small details. As some of you will know that I can remember stuff years back. And when I promise you something, or see, when I tell you I'm going to do something, I consider it a promise. Uh, only person to be sued by organized crime families. Some of you know that I got crossways with uh, one of the big organized crime families from New York uh, many years ago, and uh, they sued me in federal court. Uh, I've been run, run over by an Australian water buffalo, part of my brand. I bungee jumped at, at 69 years old, uh, and uh, the, um, I don't know, uh, it's part of my brand because I'm a risk taker. Uh, I also fought off a uh, hostile takeover bid uh, on the London Stock Exchange. Now, 
if anybody that you write, the, 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 the books you're reading have done any of these things, I'd be highly surprised. Let alone all of them, or let alone most of them. But if you even accomplish just a fraction of these, you'll be a big time, high performance fucking dude. Uh, and, the, and it's the reason why, you know, do you have it in you? Yeah. When I was growing up, they, they, not too many people thought I had it in me. My mom believed me in anything I did. But was I willing to make the sacrifices, you know, based on, if it was going to be based on my athletic ability, I had mediocre athletic ability, and whereas my dad was an all-state, all-American uh, uh, sports guy in two, three sports, I mean, uh, maybe this is why I'm compensating by proving that I could be something that he wasn't in, in this area. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, is this, is this kind of life for you? Because every single one of these things I've listed in the Dan Pena brand took a lot of sacrifice. Some took massive sacrifices. Me getting run over by a water buffalo was probably lesser of a sacrifice than some of the other things. Um, and, you know, sacrifices in time. Uh, you can see the, the right-hand tallest blue line uh, is me in terms of uh, 15 hours a day for 50 years. I'm about 130 years old in, in experience. The other line is 40 hours a week, five days a week uh, for uh, 30 years, which would be normally the normal work uh, life of uh, uh, the people that are watching this. Uh, and you can see there's a massive difference. There's, you know, there's a hundred years in difference uh, in work experience. So am I that smart? Well, I'm pretty smart, but I'm not Einstein. And it's the fact that I've, I've worked all these hours. And it's like these podcasts. I could do the podcast like everybody else. Unedit them, no visual aids, et cetera, et cetera. We have a production team that are standing around me doing this stuff. We have lighting, we have cameras. All this co uh, costs money, which is not a big deal, but it takes time. Plus, once we do one of the podcasts, then we have to edit it. My creative team is editing it. Then I have to view it, we view it together. So for every hour that I'm in front of the camera, I'm uh, a couple hours at least uh, editing it, watching it. The other pod guys don't do that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those pod guys. No, but I take things seriously because I want to be the best, you know, I can be. And it's one of the reasons, even though I'm new to the pod game, you know, I'm uh, a top of one or two of the categories for iTunes for podcasts. Um, but I do everything like this, and I require you as a mentee to do the things. So do you have it in you? Absolutely, yes. Is it for you? Only you can answer that question, uh, and perhaps, you, hopefully, you can answer it better after you've seen uh, this uh, podcast. Uh, you, can, you can throw me to the wolves, and I'll, I'll return the leading, pa leading the pack. Once you take on the role of being the leader of your pack, the people that you're going to put on your bus to be a high-performance person, uh, then you too will be the leader of the pack. And uh, I can't emphasize it enough. I mean, all these things are possible, uh, and you can make them probable, because just because it's possible. It's possible that, you know, uh, I could have been an astronaut. I'm actually too b tall, too big to be an astronaut, uh, because the capsules are, are too small. But let's say that I was smaller, uh, and that was my goal, uh, and that I was willing to devote and sacrifice. You know, people train 12, 14, 16 years in the early days uh, just for a couple spins uh, around the planet, which is pretty spectacular. Uh, and in more recent years, um, not just a couple spins, uh, but a few people went to the moon. And I was privileged to know one of the gentlemen that was the third person to walk on the moon. But those are pretty spectacular lifestyles. But just think of all the sacrifices they made. And then when their astronaut career ended, what did they do? They were retired colonels or captains in the, in, in the Navy. The captain is the same as a full colonel. What did they do? And then they had to, you know, somehow figure out how to eke out a living. Um, because the retirement uh, benefits 
of a, um, a colonel or a full captain, a captain or a full colonel in the, uh, in the military aren't that great. But uh, as I tell people at the end of the seminar, the Castle Seminar, and the people that have gone through all the material free, and it's on my website, all the content. Once you've gone through all that material, you can't say ever again, I don't know how to do it. That's the excuse that people use, okay? I tell you how to get a mentor. I tell you how to get a dream team. I, I, make, I, I make it step by step, very factual. And then if you, decide, if you don't do it, you have made a conscious decision not to do it. Heretofore, you made an unconscious decision not to be more successful or not to be a high performance person. You can't do that anymore. Um, without fear, there can be no, no, no courage. Yeah, sure, uh, early in my career, I was afraid of some of the things I did. Uh, not too many, uh, but, uh, but without fear, there can be no courage. And I continue to try to, the best I can, and that normally means 100%, not, not normally, it means 100%, uh, I accomplish things. I accomplish virtually almost everything I set out to. Some of the things that I set out to, to do uh, don't get accomplished, not for the lack of trying. Uh, the reality show and the opportunities I have in the UK and, uh, and potentially in the US uh, are, are pretty spectacular because I'll be able to spread the word to more people. Uh, and for that, again, I thank Brian Rose for giving me the opportunity on uh, London Real. Uh, and uh, the, without that, I, I would have overlooked, because I had already overlooked uh, you know, the medium of uh, a podcast. I don't know why. Uh, it's just like when um, C. Ballmer was uh, making this speech uh, in April-ish of uh, this year at uh, Oxford, uh, I think it was the debate club. He was asked, you know, uh, he says, uh, we were two trick pony. And uh, why weren't you a third trick pony, he asked himself. And he said, I can't answer that. I don't know. All I know is I was only a two trick pony. Well, uh, some could say that Great Western was uh, one trick. It wasn't really a one trick pony. I'd had two prior successes, uh, quantum successes. Uh, uh, geometric successes, not as big as uh, Great Western. Um, and then uh, subsequent to that, I've, I've trained uh, and mentored and coached many, many, many uh, geometric successes, uh, many of which I've mentioned, some of which, because they uh, don't want the notoriety, I can't mention. Um, that, uh, but hope, not hopefully that when they die, but as a few of them die off, I'll be able to uh, uh, mention a couple more. But without fear, there can be no courage, guys. And there I was earlier this year um, exhibiting some uh, courage, some people think. Um, I'm not, I don't know how much courage it took for me to jump uh, that day. Although I do know there was a, a bunch of guys standing around, because uh, it was very, very windy, a bunch of guys standing around saying, ah, dude, uh, we're going to jump, dude. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm waiting for the wind to fucking die down a little bit. Well, in the meantime, I jumped. And to the best of my knowledge, I was, I was the only motherfucker that jumped that day. And I was old enough to be their father, if not their grandfather, to most of the kids. But there I am, flying over New Zealand. Couldn't get my legs straight because I got a bad hip, an artificial hip. Couldn't get my arms straight because I got an artificial shoulder. But I'm still fucking jumping. That's the point. I took action, and I was willing to make the sacrifice. And by the way, when I hit the bottom, it hurt a lot of parts of my body. But I did it anyway. Didn't think about it. Only subsequently did I find out, because I didn't Google it, your retinas can get knocked out at my age, and all kind of shit could have happened. Uh, but I didn't think about that. I just took, took action. And at the time, I didn't think about the metaphor quantum leap. Believe me, that came after the fact. I'd like to say I was smart enough or my, my people were smart enough, but uh, all that came after the fact. So I took a big risk earlier this year at age um, almost 69, and I did a bungee jump. Later on that day, because I was feeling fired up, and by the way, the one thing that I, I, I didn't mention is uh, I also had a uh, partially torn Achilles 
uh, tendon uh, that day uh, that I was, I was limping and I had to try to fake the limp when I walked up to the, uh, uh, the tower. But later on that day, what I did, since I was uh, feeling uh, fired up, I went uh, hang gliding. Uh, and you have to climb about uh, 2,000 feet up this mountain to get up. And here I'm climbing up this 2,000, uh, extra 2,000 feet from where that thing took off. Um, and uh, with a, a, a torn, uh, slightly torn Achilles, which killed me. Hurt a lot. I didn't. I didn't piss and moan about it, but I went up because um, the. Uh, I've always considered myself as as this new uh, uh, next slide shows uh, a high performance person. Now I'm not talking about being in the middle uh, or the standard deviation from the main means standard deviations from the main uh, uh, the main mean uh, the middle. I'm talking about being in the top one tenth of a percent, uh, as I uh, alluded to earlier in uh, this podcast. There's about, let's call it seven and a half billion people on the earth. 10% uh, uh, would be uh, 700 million. 1% uh, would be 70 billion. Uh, excuse me, 1%, uh, one tenth of a percent, it'd be um, seven and a half million. So th that's who I'm training and coaching, who I want you to be. And it's not all about money, it's you know, the top of your field. You know, if you're going to be a, be a priest, uh, a priest, be the best priest. If you're going to be an artist, be the best artist. You know, get the, if you're going to be whatever you're going to be, you're going to be all you can be, as Joe Batten told me many years ago, who was the mentor of um, Ross Perot and my former business partner, and a good guy, uh, told me, uh, be all you can be. And that was the terminology he came up, the phrase he came up with uh, for the United States Army. I think it was back in the uh, 70s or 80s. Uh, to, uh, to recruit guys when they went to a voluntary army. So, I mean, again, do you have what it takes? Yeah. Uh, is this really for you? Do you want to be in that top 1 to 10 percent? Because the people that are in the top 1 to percent, ten, one tenth of a percent are the world-class people on the planet, not just the, the, uh, the guys like Gates, Jobs, Turner, Trump, uh, but the athletes like Eric Hyden, the guys that are winning all the gold medals, the, the, the top skiers in the world, I mean, because they're making huge sacrifices. Uh, but the, 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 the real question is, even if you move towards that end of the continuum, the high performance end of the continuum, you're better in your life. As I said earlier in this podcast, you know, your mother gets dementia, your kid, uh, you know, needs braces, etc., etc. All that stuff costs money. You don't buy that stuff with Zen. So you're better in your life even if you don't get to that one-tenth of a percent. But I believe in bodacious goals. And there's no reason on this planet why you can't aspire to be in the top seven and a half million people in whatever you do. Uh, there's certainly not seven and a half million billionaires. I think there's about 1,500 now. Uh, and um, in the United States, they talk about being in the top 2%. You're making, uh, oh, excuse me, top 1%. You're making about $400,000 a year. Well, I mean, to somebody that's making 50 or 60 or 80, 400 sounds like a lot. But it's really not that much. And believe me, you learn how to spend 400000 once you make 400000 I remember the month that I made, first made, $10,000 to come to Dan Penyon. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was uh, October 1974. I made 10 grand that month. I remember the first month I made 30 grand. I remember the first month I made 50 grand. And obviously I remember the 100 days that I made um, 65, uh, uh, 60 million, which is 100 million today. Uh, or 65 million, which is 100 million today, out of $60,000. I remember those, those benchmarks in my life. <clears throat> I also remember working for a dollar an hour, uh, picking weeds uh, on a big estate in the San Fernando Valley when I was about, uh, about the same time as that lion picture. Uh, I also remember uh, the first month I worked in the summer of 61, when I was 16 years old, I saw the pay, uh, I saw the pay stubs because I uh, had some questions of the uh, Social Security 
when I turned 65, so I saw this a few years ago, I made $241 in the month of um, August. Uh, now just think about that. I was getting paid $1.05 an hour as a box boy for Vons Market. And if you divide $240, that's gross, that's, two, that's 240 hours, more or less. Uh, 240 hours, and you divide that by four, roughly speaking. Four into 240 is um, 80, let's see, 60, about 60 hours a week. Now remember, I'm, uh, now I'm 16 years old. 60 hours a week, uh, making a dollar five an hour. So I was working, and I think our, 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 our regular work week was 40 hours at the time, because you have to belong to a union. So I was working 20 hours overtime, um, and I wasn't getting paid overtime, uh, because they had a stipulation, people that were less than a year, um, uh, not tenured, and not senior enough, didn't get paid overtime. So I was working 60 hours a week when I was 16 years old. And I was a high school student. Uh, and I still remember these benchmarks because they're important. And they're part of the, uh, my history. They're part of my persona. Um, but if you want to run with the, the, the big dogs and pee in the tall grass, I used to say this at the beginning of the seminars in 1993, you must get off the fucking porch and I also used to add, because dogs lick their balls, lick their privates. If you want to run with the big dogs and pee in the tall grass, you must get, stop licking your privates uh, and get off the fucking porch. Well, a lot of you are on the porch of life. And you're know, like an old hound dog. You're just lying there having, a, you know, chilling. I don't know what that means. You're chilling. <clears throat> And um, that's not how you become a high-performance person. So, I mean, do you have what it takes? Absolutely, fucking lutely you do. Um, do um, you want to make the sacrifices? And is this really for you? Or do you want to stay on the porch, licking your privates? I can't answer that question for you. I'm here to tell you that many of you will stay just licking your privates. That's a choice you have to take. And because it's the holiday season, <clears throat> going into the new year, you know, some of you will use this as incentive to make resolutions. And I'm not, make, I'm not giving this at the holiday time to give you the incentive to come to the next seminar uh, uh, in 2015. Quite frankly, I don't give a fuck if you come. I mean, uh, we're fully booked. Uh, and um, I'm happy to say that um, the, uh, we have more people that want to come. But I believe more of you do want to run with the big dogs. Um, when I see in the eyes of those that uh, come to me uh, as a QLA coach mentor, I often see fear caused by former defeats. We've all got defeats. We all have suffered at the hands of uh, how we were taught. We've all suffered at the hands of conventional wisdom. We've all suffered at the hands of uh, making mistakes, uh, being humiliated from time to time. We've all suffered uh, uh, the, uh, as they used to say in um, the wide world of sports, the um, um, the agony of defeat. Now. In spite of all that shit, you can, if you want it bad enough, go to the next level and the next level and the next level and the next level. But it's up to you. But when I, I subsequently see the look on their faces, these are the kids that come to me, after their first success in building their dream team, uh, by finding a mentor or getting lawyers and accountant firms to accept their projects, which are their dreams, on a success fee basis, and or creating deal flow, I know why I'm a coach. I know why I'm doing this. I know why I didn't go off to Vietnam and die. I know why uh, I came back and went to school, university, after flunking out three times. I know why uh, I'm fortunate that my parents had the foresight uh, to, uh, to train me, teach me as a young kid, as, as I did. And that was, that was serendipity as far as uh, my, on my part. I know why 
Uh, I got thrown out of Great Western Resources uh, on January, I believe, the um, 7th, uh, 1992. Uh, uh, excuse me, 1982. No, 1992, I was right the first time. I, and uh, just a, a few days after uh, our, my first son was born, I know why. I was, born, I, I was leaning towards this destiny to help you kids across the goal line and create a uh, minimum, so far, 50 billion uh, in uh, equity and value. Um, remember, victory belongs to those who believe it the longest and the most. Uh, 21 years ago when I started uh, QLA, uh, they laughed at me. They ridiculed me. Uh, some of the, the big guys, which some of which are still alive, uh, Gary Halbert's uh, passed on, God rest his soul, but most of the big guys that told me, why am I doing this? Uh, when we grow up, we want to be just like you. I was already living in a castle, already had Rolls Royces, etc. Uh, why, Dan? Why do you want to waste your time? Especially because the wannabes, Dan, a lot of the guys at that time couldn't look you in the eye because they knew the chances of you succeeding are so fucking slim that uh, you know, even they had guilt taking your fucking money. Well, in spite of all that, well, first of all, I was naive in those days. I didn't really believe it. I didn't believe. I thought they were telling me that shit to keep me out of the business because they were afraid of the competition. Boy, was I fucking wrong. Virtually everything they said about that was true. Uh, because, you know, you've been inundated so much with the wrong information and then in many cases, of course, a lot of the coaching success and personal development guys have come around and are g giving you good stuff. But are they giving you stuff to build a business? Are they giving you stuff to start a business from scratch? Are they giving you stuff to get accountants and lawyers to accept your dreams on a success fee basis? Are they giving you stuff how to get a, a mentor? Well, some are on the mentor part. Are they giving you stuff how to build a dream team? Are they giving you stuff how to close a deal? Are they giving you stuff how to finance the deal? Uh, I just recently did a, a podcast on how do you get the fucking money? Uh, well, are they giving you that? Well, the answer is no, 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 no. And except for the mentor, some of them do. No, no. You know, victory belongs to those who believe it the longest and the most. I believed in this system working because I saw it work for me and at the time I saw nothing special about me okay there's still nothing that's really special about me other than my accomplishments being raised by a policeman a housewife getting thrown out of school doing a lot of bad things as a teenager going off volunteering for the draft at the height of the Vietnam War wasn't weren't acts of the most intelligent kid that you're ever going to meet at 20 years old when I did it. Uh, but from that day, the, I've, I've said many, many times, the only high performance thing I had done up until that time was graduating from Officer Candidate School, Infantry Officer Candidate School, Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, in July uh, 1967. Long, long time ago. But that was my first high performance act. Many of you have never had a high performance act. Now, some of you have lettered in football, baseball, in high school and college. That's more than I could do because I had mediocre uh, skill sets vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, athletics. Some of you gradu graduated with honors. You know, some of you graduated with honors from top-notch schools around the world. That certainly wasn't me. Uh, but it's what you do. It's not what happens to you in life. It's how you react to what happens to you in life. Uh, but time is vicious when you take it for granted. Many of you have taken your lives for granted. You've been told, oh yeah, you're young, you've got all your life to do all this stuff. I tell you just the opposite. I tell you, you're young and you're going to be middle-aged soon, and unless you get off your dead fucking ass and you get off the fucking porch, stop licking your balls in privates, you're going to be in the same spot 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And that's why I get people at the seminar that are in their mid-40s, late-40s, early-50s, and older. T you know, time is vicious when you take it for granted. Money you can always remake. Time you can't get back. 
I realize I'm running out of runway. But as I said at the beginning of this seminar, uh, excuse me, this podcast, uh, people say, you look terrific, Dan. You sound terrific. You're still lucid. Well, shit, I don't know what they think. They think they're going to be saliva running down my face. I'm going to be, uh, you know, uh, stumbling along for words. But I make a lot of sacrifices to look this good. I make a lot of sacrifices to uh, sound this good in front of a camera. I make a lot of sacrifices. I eat well. I exercise like a crazy man. Uh, the, um, and my, my wife is very supportive because she looks terrific like a movie star, for those of you that have seen her. And the, um, but she eats what I eat because she wants to be supportive. Uh, and she is supportive as perhaps some of your partner spouses are, but some of them not, are not. You know, I've gotten letters from wives of mentees, leave my son alone, leave my, oh, excuse me, leave my, I've gotten them from parents too, leave my son alone, leave my, uh, my husband alone, uh, uh, you're nothing but a cult leader, okay? So I'm, 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 I'm ferociously focused on that you're going to run out of time. And even though a year seems like a long time to mentor you if you come to the castle, it's really not enough time. But it's enough time to get you started if you're serious. Again, you're all capable of it, but are you willing to make the sacrifice? I want you to understand that while I plan on doing this for a number of years yet to come, there's no guarantees. I could go down on a plane. I'm asked, who's going to take over when you're gone, Dan? Right now, there's nobody standing off in the wings. My, my kids aren't interested in this. They've got their own lives, and I don't blame them. Uh, I'm a tough act to follow. And for those of you that have ever seen me speak, uh, you know that uh, when, uh, you, uh, when I come up after you, that's okay. But when you come up after me, I'm a tough act to follow. And uh, so I, I don't blame that on anybody. But anybody that would take the baton or baton, depending on where you are in the world, from me uh, would uh, be looked upon strangely. But I plan and I will leave a legacy through my podcast, through my product that's on Torrent, through all the product that's on my website, more than enough material for the world to grasp for the next hundred years. And with a little bit of luck and me driving it like a, like a crazy man, my showbiz career vis-a-vis -vis my reality show that uh, is still in progress and my perhaps releasing, uh, re-releasing of my book uh, and a few other things, I'll leave enough materials to last more than a hundred years, a thousand years. There's still stuff being read that was written before Christ was born, uh, and I expect that they'll be reading my stuff at least 2,000 years from now. God bless. Peace.